Well, this week is a great week um, with great opportunities for you to be able to uh, participate and uh, get plugged in here at North. Uh, tonight is her night. Come on, ladies. Tonight is her night. Uh, still opportunity for you to invite your friends, begin to bring them and show up uh, expecting great things for tonight. I believe it's going to encourage you and, and speak uh, into your life. And then also we have this week as our OB. One big party, which is for our student ministry, is our one biggest outreach of the year. And so we're expecting hundreds of kids. Last year we had some 500 students show up, and it is a great opportunity for many of them to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So load up your vans, call your friends, get your kids to bring their kids, friends, and show up and believe great things. And then today, today is our launch of our North groups, okay? Uh, and so I hope that you are choosing to be a part of that. And why, why is that? Because we believe that um, we refuse to do life alone. What does that look like? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name. Two or three, that's a small group. Gathered in his name, okay? Uh, you get in groups all the time. Uh, that would, could be sport groups. It could be work groups. It could be cubicles at work. You're talking about things. But when are you getting together with other people centered around Jesus Christ? And that's what a group is all about. And we believe small group is a place for you to be needed and to be known. All right? And all of us need to be needed and to be known. And a small group provides that for you. And so as a church, one of my goals is that North Church will be a small church with a lot of people. Now let that settle in, settle in just a little bit. A small church with a lot of people. That can't happen apart from small groups. And so... Even if you are not, you got a brochure on your uh, seat, you can take that at Guthrie, Oklahoma City, go through there and pick one. Uh, or uh, we're open for you to get your friends, gather, and let's talk God's word, and let's grow together, okay? So today, we're continuing the series from the book of Ephesians, but we're actually having a new series today also. That may be confusing. Let me explain. Today, we're starting a new series called The Good Neighbor, and we're going to look at chapters four, five, and six in this series of the book of Ephesians. We've just wrapped up Ephesians chapter one, two, and three on going from death unto life. The first three chapters deal with the principles of our faith. And we're gonna to start today talking about the practical side of our faith. Would you stand with me and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number four. If you don't have your Bibles with you, your digital device, you can look at the big screen in the sky and follow along uh, with the scripture reading. We're going to be covering a lot of scripture from verse 1 through verse number 16 today. So let's start with verse number 1 and we will also stop there too. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Just one more time, let's read it. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, Beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Beg you to lead a life. Beg you. Sounds like a pastor's heart. Desiring the best for the people that he is shepherding and leading. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you are called by God. What does that mean? Sometimes we think a life worthy is a life that's successful, correct? I, th I think we do. There's certain things that you've put on what success looks like. How much you get paid, promotions, people in your life, health, all those things are nothing necessarily wrong with them, but does it really equal a worthy life? Not necessarily. Matter of fact, Paul is writing this from prison. He says, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. Physically a prisoner he was at the time. Now, in chapter number three, he also stated, I'm a prisoner. He wants you to know that. I think sometimes that uh, Paul is wanting to get, us, get across the understanding that sometimes your worth is not measured by your successes. It's measured by your obedience to the calling that God has placed before you. Is that you can be facing cancer and live a life worthy of the calling of God. You can be just now received your pink slip at work and lost your job, but be living a life worthy. I want to I sign up for a life worthy of the calling of God, right? Amen. Would you hold out your hands and repeat this after me? Say, Lord Jesus, give me the ears to hear what you have to say. Give me the faith to believe what you say. 
And give me the courage to obey what you say. It's in your name I pray. And everybody said a big amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, this week I was talking to a gentleman in the church that I already knew this information that his mom had been diagnosed with a malignant tumor and would only have weeks and at best just a few short months to live. It was a big eye-opener because she basically has been very healthy. She has been doing incredible. She is loving life. She is serving and working and all of those things. And, and to be all of a sudden a few headaches, go to the doctor and find out your stage four inoperable tumor was huge. But he touched my heart how he said his mom's responded. It's been a few weeks now. And she's starting to have some of those symptoms come more rapid. But how that she has said from the beginning, she said, you know what? God is good. And God's got this. And she's going to live her life worthy of the calling that God has placed before her. And when he began to tell me that, I, te I teared up and began to cry right there listening. And I also thought of another gentleman in our church named Ben Fuller. His wife Betty still attends our church and he died several years back. But early on, 17 years ago, they just showed up out of the blue and began to attend North Church. And Ben touched my life because he was given kind of the same prognosis in regards to cancer with a very short lifespan. And I watched him die with the same grace in which he lived. He, he faced death with a joy unspeakable and full of glory, which encouraged me. And Ben touched my life in so many ways. And I was thinking this week about him because he lived a life worthy of his calling. And I thought of three ways in which he did. First off, Ben was a unifier, not a divider. Everywhere he went, he was unifying people, bringing peace and joy, not dividing people. Number two is that he used his gifts and calling that God had placed on his life to encourage and to equip every single person he met. He went around whistling everywhere he went, and he was a beautiful whistler. He went around offering joy to everyone. He had a gift of helps. He had a gift of leadership. He ended up serving as one of our elders in the church all the way up until his death. He used his gifts. And number three, Ben was always on an upward trend to growing to becoming more like Jesus. His goal in life was to see how much more he could become like Jesus. Even as he got older, he wanted to keep growing up and to the right. And as I was thinking about this and then reading from Ephesians chapter number four, I find some of those same principles that kept popping up on a life that is worthy. And so I want you to write this down in your notes because a life worthy or a worthy life is First off, always striving for unity within the community of believers. Always striving for unity within the community of believers. Now, in the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul makes it very clear that kind of if you take an overview, Ephesians is about the unity of the body. Ephesians is about all these people around the world. Jesus has made one new people. If you go back to chapter 2 in the message I spoke a few weeks ago, basically he says there's now no Jew nor Gentile. Now, Paul points out that the strife, the disunity, and the lack of peace around the world has been because of the racial divisions, the nationality divisions, the ethnic division. And that tension in the human race is because people begin to feel more superior than others or they try to elevate themselves above other people, which Paul lays out is sin. And he says the solution for this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That through Jesus Christ, now it's not about ethnic groups and it's not about nationality and it's not about, you know, skin color or tone of color or anything like that. It's about we are all now one new people in Christ Jesus. He said, oh, no, pastor, I'm just, no, no. He makes it very clear. You're either Jew or Gentile, and now Jews and Gentiles are now all one under Christ Jesus. 
And in verse number two of chapter four, he begins to deal with the practical side of creating peace and unity in our lives. Look at verse two. He says, always be humble and gentle. If you want to live a life worthy of your calling, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Out of love will flow what? Those things. See, Paul's telling us the quickest way to diffuse tension and create peace and unity is to do what? Three things. One, come on, practice humility and gentleness. Oh, how many of you know that pride is a big divider in relationships? Come on, when I have tension in my relationships, it's often related to the pride in my own life that's trying to get my way or the highway. Oh, anybody tracking with me right now? But it is amazing what humility and gentleness will do to bring peace among a body, in a home, at work. And then he says patience, because each one of these build on each other. Because when you walk in humility and walk in gentleness, then patience comes in. Matter of fact, you learn how to understand people better and you're okay. Because you know your own weaknesses and you know your own failings and you are more patient with other people. And so he points that out. And then he says another word, forbearing. Now, it wasn't in what we read, right? Because in what we read was he basically said, all right, make an allowance for each other's faults. But if you go to other translations like the NIV or maybe the New American Standard or others, it would use the word forbearing. So that was the third word that jumps out, forbearing. It means you are very understanding. And because of the love that you have for people, you are going to do whatever you can to forgive and to work with them. Now, in the book of Psalms chapter number 131, David, he is the one speaking that chapter. And he has been anointed the king of Israel. Now, you got to understand what's happened is David has been on the run for the last 15 years of his life. Saul divided the country. There was a lack of peace in the country. David has ran and hidden in caves. And now Saul is dead and he is appointed back as the king, okay, that he'd been anointed to do 15 years before. And he is anointed with oil at Hebron. And then he gets up and he says this to the people. Listen to these words. He says, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that's placed upon Aaron's head that flows down his beard and across his garments. It is like the dew that's placed on Mount, falls down from Zion onto Mount Hermon. And he says, God's blessings and favor is there forevermore. You know what David is doing? David is again reuniting a country. He's speaking peace on a country. And he's saying if we can work together in unity, it is like the oil or the blessings of God falling from heaven that begins to make us fruitful and God's blessings are forever on that place. How many want that? And you say, sign me up that for my home, my job, my life, and our church. Anybody? It's what David is doing. Look at verse number three. He says, therefore, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Make every effort. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all, in all and living what? Through all. Do you get his point here? He said, the goal is to be one new people. The goal is that we do everything we can to create unity and the peace of God in our relationships. How do we do that? It's understanding our commonness. It's understanding our commonness as a people. What does that mean? First off is this. There are common convictions about Christ that we share that makes us one new people. Common convictions about Christ. That's dealing with who he is. Who is he? Who is Jesus? See, we're gathered here today. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, that's okay. Set in, listen. Hopefully you see the unity and the love among us that comes from all different backgrounds, all different tones of skin, all different economic backgrounds, all different nationalities, and you are encouraged to realize that that's what God really wants here on this earth. Who is he? The common conviction about Christ is this, is that he's the son of God. 
He is the son of a living God who stepped out eternity into time. And that secondly, he lived a sinless life. And because he lived a sinless life, he is the first person ever that became qualified to be the substitutionary work on the cross of Calvary. In other words, he would atone for the sins that have happened to man years before. And so he stepped into my place and died for me. He stepped into your place and died for you. That's a common conviction we have. And then ultimately, the common conviction about Christ is that he rose again. After he died, he held the keys to death, hell, and grave, kicked out the end of the grave, and came out, and he now stands living as a living God. He is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's my father now. He stands at the right hand of God making intercession for us. And now because he lives, we can live because of the same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead now lives inside of me and lives inside of you, and we are one new people in Christ Jesus. We also have a common confidence in Christ. This is who we are. So the conviction about Christ is who he is, but the common confidence in Christ is about who we are. Who are we? We are now children of God. We are now joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are now equally loved and equally valued. How many of you have children? Okay. Any of you would most likely not say, I value this one over that one. I love this one more than that one. Now, you know that each one of your children have different gifts and talents, and some of them bring different uniqueness that make you smile about different things. I understand that same way with the body of Christ. But you value and you love everyone, if you have any worth at all, equally the same, no matter if they're doing exactly what you want them to do or not. Amen? And God's looking at us and says, we have a a common confidence in Christ that we are all his children, that we are equally loved, that we are equally valued. And because of that, we can come boldly into his presence, the throne room of God. So my kids have access at any time. I don't say, no, you take order and Annabeth goes first and then Phaedra and then Gavin. No, no, no. Every one of them have equal access into my presence. And because we have this confidence in Christ, we have the understanding that we're children of God, equally loved, equally valued, and equal access to his presence. Okay, because of those two things, who he is and who we are, we also better understand what we do. And that is the common care for each other. When there's unity and peace, there's a common care among each. We are sensitive to other people's needs. We are doing what we can to reach out and to serve others in need. We become aware. We're praying. Jesus gave the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, the audience he's talking to, and he says, Good Samaritan does not make sense. Okay, because the audience he's speaking to, there's no such thing as a good what? Samaritan. But Jesus is... Resetting things. He's resetting another understanding already. He's planting the seed that it's all about one new people. It's not about Samaritans. It's not about the Gentiles. It's not about the Jews. It's about those who are one in Christ. So the first thing I gave you was that a worthy life is always striving for unity within the community of believers. The second thing is this. A worthy life is using your gifts to encourage and equip the body. A worthy life, like Ben, using his gifts to encourage and equip the body. This past week, I took my truck in to get serviced, oil change, tire rotation. I knew I had a headlight that was out I wanted to have replaced. I drop off. I always look forward to this guy named George. Okay? George has the gifts of encouragement and helps. In fact, I called two days before to schedule my appointment and I requested for George. I always do that. I showed up just shortly before 7 a.m. in the morning. Guess who was there waiting on me? It opens at 7 o'clock. George was there waiting. George asked all the right questions. He wants to help in any way possible. He keeps me well informed. George always cleans out my truck, which I found out that doesn't happen for everybody that's being served. He actually takes my truck through a wash and has it rinsed off. 
And I'm like thinking, who does this? In fact, every once in a while in the six month difference and period when I come in and I, I will get sometimes a text from him just saying, Mr. Faust, just checking to see if you're doing okay today. I'm like, Who's doing, who does that? Matter of fact, this time after him just serving me and I got my truck and ready to leave, he said, Mr. Fouts, do you mind if I pray with you? I looked around and I'm like, am I at North Church? <laughs> and I said, sure. And he prayed over me this most fabulous prayer of encouragement and built me up. I walked away thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Come on, won't you come to North Church? <laughs> because he's using his gifts. Look at verse number seven. Look at verse number seven. Notice what it says. However, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Now, what does that mean? He's given to each of us, you and me, a gift. That means that every member is a minister. It's not that I'm a minister and you're not. We are all ministers. We're all part of the priesthood of Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, it was limited to a few that could come into the inner sanctum or inner room in the presence of God, and only a few people could, no, no, no. But now, through Christ, we are no one people. We are all ministers. We're all part of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number eight. He says, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. What is that about? He led a crowd of captives. Most theologians would believe, I tend to believe this too, is that when Jesus died and went down to heaven, it says he went to the innermost parts of the earth. He took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, the spirits that had been held over the period of time before Christ because Christ hadn't come and offered the sacrifice. When he offered the sacrifice, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The wall of hostility was torn down. And now he goes in, takes the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He leads captives free once and for all. And then he takes gifts, and those gifts are distributed among us, the believers of Christ. In verse number nine, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Look at verse number 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Now, those are the five-fold ministry gifts. They're not comprehensive. I'm going to give you more of them in just a moment that will speak to all the gifts. Verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That is my role. That's what you're here for today is to be equipped and to be built up and encouraged so that you can go out and you can minister also as part of the priesthood. Whenever I was, Shanna, this summer, we were in London, and we were at the Hillsong Conference, the great conference, enjoyed ourselves very much. There was a certain lady, I didn't know who she was, that during a prayer time, I just felt prompted to say, pr pray for her. And I just got her attention and said, I'll, I'll pray for you. And I felt like God had given me some discernment in a situation and even a word of knowledge. And I spoke over her and prayed over her. Didn't even get her name. This is months ago. This week, the church received an email that was asked to be forwarded to me, and it was this girl, which I learned of her name. I think she told me then, but I didn't remember. Her name's Hannah. And here's what she said in the email that she sent to me and to Shannon. She said, a couple of months ago, I met Pastor Rodney and Pastor Shannon very briefly at the Hillsong Conference in London. This young lady was from the Netherlands. There was a specific moment in the service where we prayed for healing. My mother and me both had the same heart condition, a condition that makes our heart muscle grow until it needs surgery because it blocks the outflow of blood. At the conference, there was a moment where we prayed for healing and you prayed for my muscle and my heart. Last month, I had another ultrasound and this morning, I heard the news that my muscle has decreased from 18 to 16 milliliters. That is a miracle because there are no cures that can decrease the growth of the heart muscle. On top of that, my mom hasn't experienced any arrhythmia over the last 
few months since the prayer. And I'm believing that this is a miracle. And thanks for stepping out and praying that afternoon for a miracle in my life. I believe it started and will continue to be rolled out in our life. To God be glory. Now, is that my role only? Absolutely not. Look at these 20 different spiritual gifts. Look here. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healings. When I read these out, I want you to think about your own life. What is it that God has given you that is a gift to be used to equip and encourage the body? What is it that you need to ask for? Discernment, apostle, teaching, helps, administration, evangelism, pastor, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, hospitality, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. What is it? What is it? I believe that there's gifts that God has laid upon individuals' lives that are much more permanent. I also believe that some of them are for specific moments. Does that make sense? That sometimes God moves on me with certain things for that moment that is needed in that situation. Several years back, I saw a billboard that was of Michael Jordan and shot, and it said this, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. For some of you listening to me right now, you've put your gifts up on a shelf and you're not using them again. And God is calling you by the Holy Spirit to pull those gifts back off and start using them one more time for the body of Christ. Why do we have groups? Why do we have groups? Come on, to have unity and peace in the group. Why do we have groups? So that you can use your gifts to pray for people, encourage people, and build people up. I I love to hear, there's nothing I love more, to hear how that God is using individuals with the gifts of the Spirit in their groups and at work in different places to bring glory and honor to God. But remember this. Remember this about your gifts. Don't mistake gifts for godliness. And don't let your charisma outrun your character. Stay focused on who it is all about. It's about Jesus and bringing glory to him. Amen? Amen. Bringing glory and honor to him. So the third thing is this. A life, a worthy life is thirdly, emotionally, emotionally, and spiritual maturity that looks more and more like Jesus. A worthy life is emotional and spiritual maturity that looks more and more like Jesus. Ultimately, the goal, folks, is Jesus. It's Jesus. Look at verse number 13. It says, This will continue until we come to such unity and faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. What will continue? The unity working together, the using of our gifts to encourage and build people up, Look at verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Notice that Paul says we will no longer be immature. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, is stating that also he can be immature. How many know that all of us can be immature like children at times? With our roommates, with our parents, with our spouses, with people we work with, with people in the church. All of us can be immature. But here's the go. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. I don't want to be a spiritual baby, do you? Our, our grandson Gideon is, is he, he has two teeth already. <laughs> okay, month four, right at the end of month four, he had two teeth break through and uh, just the tenth of this month he turned five months old. And so, you know, sometimes as a mom, it's really... You know, Taking care of babies a lot. Uh, how many knows that though when they're, before they start walking and crawling, if they're crying, you can still walk away. But after they start crawling and walking, it's like eyes on all the time, right? When, when our kids, I remember one of them specifically that was in diapers, moving around, just probably about a year and a half old. Um, we noticed that these plugins that we were placing around the house to make it smell good in the house, because we'd have people come over quite often. We entertain a lot. Uh, all, they were running dry quick. They supposed to be lasting like a week and a half or two weeks, and they're like running dry. And we couldn't figure out what was going on uh, until one day we caught one of our kids over there at one of those plug-ins with their mouth at the bottom of it, sucking all of the smell good out of the bottom. It did make for better smelling diapers The next thing we're dealing with is poison control. It causes them, they're going to die. 
we're calling poison control and you know, they point out, no, no, the FDA has approved all that stuff because there's been kids before us that have done those type of things, okay? But Paul points out here that spiritual babies, get this, this is important to understand, they're not discerning, they're self-centered, and they're wishy-washy. First off, they're not discerning. I- I'm hoping that your discernment level of spiritual gifts the presence of God in your life will go to a whole other level. While you're meant to come to God as a child, as a baby, you're not meant to stay a spiritual baby. You're meant to grow. And babies that are not discerning are easily influenced and follow the crowd and they're unaware of the dangers that are before them. Did you hear me? I want you to grow up in Christ. Spiritual babies are self-centered. It means me first. I want it my way or the highway. I, I, I want my style of doing things. I, I want to show up and, you know, you do it. No, no. And al- also you can't handle critique. When you're self-centered, you cannot handle. And so therefore we stay closed off to a group. I can't go to a group because if I go to a group, I got to open up. And I really, that makes me feel uncomfortable. That uncomfortableness really speaks to the issue of spiritual maturity because we're called to open up so that others can be a part of critique. I was thinking about this in regards to, you know, athletes. How can you imagine any athlete rising to the top of their game without being a part of a small group, a team, and coaches speaking into their life? No, they open themselves up to the critique, and those who can handle it are the ones who rise to the highest level. That's what we should be doing spiritually and emotionally is rising to the level. That means we got to open up to others and not be self-centered and wishy-washy. In other words, I've got to be entertained. And we live in a culture where we, we're consumers. We're consumers. What can I get out of instead of contributors? And so we're going to be at this church until, you know, the pastor is no longer making me feel good or there's a better speaker down the road or the lots are better and it's more excitement down there. Then I'm going to run over to this place and I'm going to have fun here for about a year or two. And then, like, they get old and I'm going to run to somewhere else. And really, who is the spiritual baby? It is us who are wishy-washy running around everywhere. Instead of getting into the body and say, how can I help grow me in this body? And then also, when we hear God's word and we walk out and we do nothing with it and we leave it here, how many of you before have felt the prompting of the spirit to act upon something and you walk out and leave what God spoke here in the church? What that speaks to is wishy-washy. I love that word, (laughs) wishy-washy. I made it up for today. Look at verse number 15. Verse number 15, he says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Notice it says we'll speak the truth in love. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of what? Full of love. Full of love. He starts off by speak the truth in love. He ends up by being full of love. Emotionally and spiritually mature people love others. Hear me? If there's disunity and lack of peace, it speaks to, you can't control them. Now what I'm saying is that if they want to create unity, disunity and lack of peace, you can't control them, but you can control your response to them. Anybody listen to this? John said this, if someone says, I love God, but does not get along with their brother, they're a liar. For if you don't love people who you can see, how can you love a God? Who love people who you can see, how can you love a God who you can't see? You can't do it, folks. That's pretty straightforward. And because you love people, spiritually and emotionally mature people value others. The way God valued people. And then finally, you understand your need for other people. I've been around people before like, they're God's gift to the world. They're mature and spiritual. And pastor, I have something to offer. Usually it speaks to the really spiritual babies and just don't realize it. They may know a lot of scripture. They may have a lot of experience in ministry. But truly, emotionally and spiritually mature people understand that everybody Everybody can, they can learn from somebody today. And they don't come around haughty and I've got all the, 
knowledge and information and I can just bless everybody. No, no, you come in humble, humble. Some of the greatest athletes in the world, it amazes me after a game or after a big victory, they'll interview them and some of the most humble ones, they'll look at the camera and say these words and say, I got to get better. They don't deal with their opponent as much as like, it's about me getting better. It's about me getting better. The reason why they've gotten to the top is because of this understanding that it's not about them, it's about me getting better, getting better. It's not about comparing myself to them, it's about comparing myself to where I can be. As a follower of Jesus Christ, true spirituality is measuring up to Christ, not other people. True spirituality is looking inside of you and realizing that the closer you get to Christ, the more you realize you need him and the further you are from him. And that there's more God can do in me. Remember that little song as a kid? Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars? Jupiter and Mars? But God's still working on me. Because you're his greatest project. Amen? Amen. Eyes closed, no one looking around. Holy Spirit is here, first off, to save lives. If you're here and you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you don't know Him as your Savior. What does that mean? It means that all of us, and you know inside of you that God has placed eternity in your hearts, and that you're undone, that you're not complete. You will not be complete apart from Christ. You can add whatever you want into your life. It's not going to make you complete. And if you try to make Jesus just another part of your life, you're sadly mistaken too. He must become Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. It means that you humbly submit and realize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, you're my answer. If that's you and right now God is speaking to you about committing your life and asking forgiveness of your sins and asking every, him to come into your life, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Let's say it together as a church family. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And come into my heart. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name. 